Nearly 1,300 auto workers walked off the job today in what is expected to be the biggest strike United Auto Workers Union has ever staged, simultaneously hitting Detroit's big three, General Motors, Ford, and Stellantis. Workers in plants located in Michigan, Ohio, and Missouri are on the picket line amid a contract dispute, demanding a 40 percent increase in pay, pensions, and better work hours. Though not all 150,000 UAW members have walked out, a union, leader, union leaders have said a work stoppage could expand if talks remain stagnant. Meanwhile, Ford CEO balked at the UAW's demands. Here he is on CNBC. Let's watch. If we signed up for the UAW's request, instead of making money and distributing $75,000 in profit sharing in the last 10 years, we would have lost $15 billion and gone bankrupt by now. There's no way we can be sustainable as a company. That's why we put our proposal in two weeks ago to say, look, you want, you want us to choose bankruptcy over supporting our workers? Here's our proposal. Let's work through this. We've heard nothing. The UAW alleges Farley made a whopping $21 million just last year. President Biden will address the historic strike in hours to come. I guess we're going to see if Biden really is the most pro-labor president in American history. I don't know how I feel about that. I'm leaning on probably not. It's probably still going to be FDR considering how he handled the rail workers strike. But the position the auto workers in is so unique because they took a bunch of concessions uh, when they didn't have to in 2008 so that the industry wouldn't collapse. They said, OK, we understand we're in a tough spot. We have this recession. We'll take a pay and benefits cut so that the industry stays above water. And since 2008, auto workers wages have steadily declined, whether you're in manufacturing or you're in more of the front of the shop. But if you're working for an automaker, we've seen wages decline 10 to 19 percent. And we're seeing record profits and CEOs giving themselves pretty large salaries. And so it seems very fair to me to negotiate with these workers and at least let them recover the wages that they've lost over the last 10 plus years. Yeah, I think that's right. 40 percent is maybe a high starting point, but that's kind of how negotiations go. If you look at polls with the American people, 79 percent are on the side of the UAW workers versus 19 percent or so on the side of the bosses or the CEOs of these companies. But there's a lot of policy problems related to the auto industry right now as well, um, one of which is just the fact that so much of the manufacturing has gone overseas in the past couple of decades. One of the things that Trump did when he was in office was he tried to bring some of the uh, parts back to at least North America. Some of them are now being produced in Mexico as opposed to in China or Korea or Japan. Um, so that was a good first step, but there's still too much of the automaking process that is done overseas. Workers in America now have a very small stake in the finished automobiles that are being sold from these big three companies, which reduces their bargaining power as well, and obviously um, reduces the number of people that these auto companies are going to hire. And then from the Biden administration, you have this job killing electric vehicle mandate where they're trying to make sure that 50 percent of all new vehicles sold by 2030 are going to be EVs. Well, EVs not only reduce the amount of labor required from auto workers, they're also more expensive to produce. They're more expensive for the consumer, so fewer people are willing to buy them. And there's all of these problems with the, their ability to be charged, the cost of the batteries, the manufacturing of the batteries, which requires mining in Africa, where China controls all of the mines. So for Biden to say that he's the most pro-labor president and then introduce all of these regulations on the auto industry, which is already struggling immensely in the U.S., just is so backwards and contradictory. Yeah, I mean, when we look at the profits between 2013 and 2022 of the big three, we see that they're up 92 percent. So looking at GM, Ford and Stellantis, 92 percent for them means a, a combined $250 billion in total. So when you see profits being up 92 percent, wages have declined 19 percent for workers in the in the warehouses manufacturing the vehicles when you look at those making the parts they're declining about 10 percent but profits being up 92 percent they can actually very easily afford 
this 40% raise in compensation to the workers. And so to have these CEOs, we just saw the, the CEO of Disney also say that the demands are ridiculous, something along those lines for, for the workers there for the, the SAG-AFTRA strike. Now we have another situation where they're like, this is ridiculous. They're asking for so much. But if we just look at the data, it's very clear that they can afford this. And it's simply like greed that's getting in the way of them not compensating their workers. When you see that a lot of that money is going to the executives, they're deciding to compensate themselves much more. They're not in, even investing a majority of their profits in transitioning to renewable energy. If they're reinvesting their revenue in the company and in development of EVs, I'd be like, okay, well, at least the money's going somewhere that's like kind of good. We're transitioning towards renewable energy, towards a green economy, but it's not going to the workers. It's not going to renewable or green energy. And so it's a ridiculous scenario where now they're making the workers seem greedy for asking for the bare minimum when we've seen the cost of living go up so much in the country. So hopefully Biden says something along the lines of supporting the workers in this case today. I think we're all waiting on that Biden speech. Yeah, definitely. And he said just a short while ago that he didn't think that the UAW strike was going to happen. That was on Labor Day. And then sure enough, he was proven wrong. Um, clearly, he doesn't have his finger on the pulse of the American worker. And it's not surprising, given how much his administration has tried to downplay the economic concerns of average Americans. They've been unwilling to acknowledge that inflation is a real problem. They're trying to run his 2024 campaign on the concept of Bidenomics. Um, he has admitted recently that the Inflation Reduction Act was not really about reducing inflation and that he regrets the name of it because it was really about imposing a new climate agenda and spending on things like planting trees and things like this electric vehicle vehicle mandate and all of these other um, environmental policies and not really trying to reduce inflationary pressure on Americans. And uh, his, his, uh, his spokespeople have repeatedly condescended to people who do express that they're having a difficult time paying for their lives and for their families. I mean, Jen Psaki, just a couple of years ago from the press podium, dismissed concerns about supply chain issues as the tragedy of the treadmill that's delayed when people were un unable to get access to baby formula. And then you had uh, Pete Buttigieg and uh, Secretary Granholm just scoff at people who were concerned about gas prices by telling them to buy $60,000 electric vehicles. So they're clearly completely out of touch with the reality of the economic situation that people in this country are facing. Yeah, I think there are some aspects of the Inflation Reduction Act that would definitely reduce inflation. But in the long run, I think if they were going to take an approach to reduce inflation in the short run, they would have had to negotiate with grocery stores. They would have had to negotiate with oil companies. They would have had to talk with Wall Street about the speculative bets that were driving up oil prices when people were betting on oil futures being on the rise when COVID was definitely a factor in making the, the energy market extremely unstable because you had many people hedging the market trying to see, well, if there's another variant that hits and the price of a barrel of oil goes to zero, what do we expect the price of oil to be? Essentially treating the economy like some kind of, like, and the stock market, like some kind of casino. It's kind of ridiculous uh, what Wall Street is getting away with and the consequences for everyday Americans when they're just betting on making money on what the price of oil will be and accurately predicting it. There are people who cannot feed their families when the price of, of gas goes up because they have to get to work every day to keep their job and their income stream. So they could have done some things to address those immediate needs. But instead, this approach that they took, right, they decide, OK, well, energy is going to get very expensive in the future. If we are to transition to renewable energy, energy costs will go down. But it's in the very long run. And we really needed something from the administration to address those immediate costs that were hurting families in America and still are. And I think that's why the Bidenomics just isn't landing, because the average person isn't thinking in advance. The average person in the United States cares about putting food on the table over the next week and making rent. And so I just think that the policy misses on behalf of the Democrats just come from a lot of them and a lot of people in politics in general, just exactly like you said, not having uh, their finger on the pulse when it comes to working people, because maybe they don't have a lot of working people in their administration. I think if we see this go really badly for the Biden administration, it's because they're incredibly out of touch because we've seen pretty homogenous support 
for the United Auto Workers among everyday people. And so they might just not have a lot of everyday people in their cabinet if we see them side with the auto manufacturers on this one. Yeah, I think that's right. And you make a good point about the short-term costs of these policies because if you're looking at trying to get food on the table, you're not thinking, okay, in 2060, wind energy or wind power will finally be uh, you know, cheap and, and abundantly available. We'll have figured out the power grid system as well. That's, uh, that's the last thing of, of, that people should have to worry about when it comes to heating, cooling their homes and, and, and other you know, needs uh, uh, related to energy. We'll be back with more rising after this.